Support for Lab Out Loud is provided by NSTA, the National Science Teaching Association. Find out more about what NSTA has to offer at nsta.org. You're listening to Lab Out Loud, science for the classroom and beyond. And today we have another scientist talking to us as we take a look at nature and how it can inspire students. Looking at how nature has adapted different bird forms to suit different functions. You have peregrine falcons that are masters of speed. You know, they're living weapons, they're missiles that go really high into the sky. So yeah, it's all all about trying to um, engage with them in a way that maybe raises aspirations to do with science. They might not see themselves as being able to be a scientist, but just trying to show that science can be interesting and fun. And if there's something they like, chances are there'll be some scientific research linked to it. That's up next on Lab Out Loud, but first I'm your co-host Dale Basler. And I'm Brian Bartell. And today's podcast, ooh, this is from the before times. <laughs> this <laughs> BP, this, this, before pandemic? Yeah, this is another one of our, I think it'll be a final for the season, uh, Scientist Out Loud. Tell us about the Scientist Out Loud, Brian. Yeah, well, we started this series this season where we were in, we were decided to interview scientists, partly because um, it, this, it just came up and I, there, there's a certain scientist that we will reach out to and try to interview next year. But mm-hmm. um, this kind of, this started out as a kind of like a trip down science Twitter. And I was able to connect with a lot of research scientists that are loving to talk to us and inspire students. And the other piece of this is that we have a lot of episodes on Lab Out Loud that are very teacher centered. And these are things that um, I know a lot of you appreciate. You've gotten you know a hold of us and saying these are great resources. But every now and then, it's nice to have some episodes that students can listen to. So some, sure. some of this was, let's get some scientists to talk about what they do, how they got there, and why it's important. And, and, and we have about, um, what is this, our fifth or sixth? This will be our sixth episode of okay. the Scientist Out Loud series. Perfect. Now, so the before times, meaning that we recorded this with all good intentions of releasing it, but this was recorded way back in February 13th of 2020. And then, um, I don't know if you guys heard. Uh, (laughs) Some things happened. (laughs) Some things happened. So we released uh, several sort of uh, COVID-19 and teaching during pandemic uh, related episodes, which bumped back our guest. Um, for a while but it's interesting to go back and listen to this episode we talk about um, birds and they put masks on birds and i found myself (laughs) like i was questioning like how come we're not talking about the the birds wearing masks thinking about pandemic mask but it's a different mask but that was in my head right away um they put the masks on the birds so that they can measure their energetics while they're in a wind tunnel yes um they talk about they we talk about Liverpool. I mentioned Liverpool Football Club and how they were unstoppable. Well, they did get stopped by the everything got canceled by the pandemic. Um, he even talks about an event that he was doing. Our guest talks about um, a big event that he's planning and things like that. And I'm sure all of that changed. And it's really kind of fascinating to look back. But the whole discussion about the essence of um, this episode is still there and it's still still valuable. But I just wanted people to understand that what you're hearing was several months ago and it was put on pause because of that. So joining us today is Dr. Alex Evans. Uh, so my name's Alex Evans. Um, I'm currently working as a science educator and presenter and writer. Um, I'm based in the UK, um, but previously I was a research scientist working in the field of uh, animal physiology, uh, specifically on uh, animal flight, mostly birds, but also working with insects, trying to understand um, the energetics of flight, how uh, how animals take the energy they get from their food and transform that into the power that allows them to take into the skies. Ooh, that's uh, fascinating. And, and you never cross into like flying mammals at all? No. So that's one thing I really wished uh, I'd, I'd gotten involved with. So obviously bats, um, would have been a fascinating area to work with. I, I had some friends uh, who worked with bats. And even though there's a lot of uh, similarities in terms of the um, aerodynamics and the physics, um, the biology of an evolution of how flight has occurred um, independently between bat, uh, between mammals and birds uh, is something I really would have loved to have spent more time researching. Hmm. We hmm. have flying squirrels, not exactly 
not quite flying, of course, here no. in, <laughs> in in North America, but that's a uh, that's we get close to that too, obviously. And They're we more do like have definitely parachuting bats. squirrels, right? Pretty yeah. much leaping like squirrels, that. leaping yeah. squirrels. Where in uh, the UK are you? So at the moment, I'm based in the Midlands. So I was born in Nottingham, um, Robin Hood's territory, and I've moved back there again now. But uh, I spent ten years. Um, in Leeds, which is where I did all all of my uh, science degrees and my uh, my PhD as well. Okay, and was animals studying animals um, or maybe birds specific? Is that something that was a path that you started long ago or uh, more recent? Yeah, so I'd say uh, my interest in animals started when I was um, when I was just a young kid. Uh, it was mostly um, nature documentaries like those of David Attenborough. Really oh, sure. got me interested in learning about wildlife, uh, and also trips to natural history museums where you can see you know, specimens of animals from all over the world. Um, and so I knew I wanted to study uh, life. So I went to university and studied biology, which is life in the broadest sense. Um, I narrowed it down to zoology during my second year because I, I was more of a fan of the animals than the plant side of things. Mm-hmm. Um, and then. After that, I wasn't sure where I wanted to go, but again, I was still really interested in animals. Um, so I did a master's degree in biodiversity and conservation, uh, which was more of the practical hands-on side. Um, still a lot of academic research, um, but I got to work uh, very closely with animals uh, out um, in nature. Um, and it was during that time that I started working with birds and I kind of developed a, a passion for learning about them, working with them. And so when I'd finished my master's uh, and it came time to think about next steps, I noticed there was a PhD uh, Mm -hmm. position going available at the University of Leeds, um, all about birds, uh, bird flight. So I went for that. And very luckily enough, I was able to get that. So I spent the Mm -hmm. next five years um, researching not only bird flight, but other forms of flight in uh, in insects as well. Sure. Did you uh, have pets when you were a kid? Yeah. So... um, just cats and dogs. I've I've always wanted um, a parrot. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's my dream. I, most of the people, well, I say most of the people, most of the accounts I follow on Twitter tend to be parrots of some sort. <laughs> okay, the actual parrots um, themselves are pa- parrot owners. <laughs> yeah, wait a minute. Uh, wait. Mo- most how are they typing? Them- how are they tweeting? Wait. <laughs> <laughs> most of them tend to have their own accounts. Oh, obviously, I mean, you know. They're not run by by them, but it's it's nice to see when you read things coming from the perspective of of the birds. It's a nice twist on things. Well, it's absolutely appropriate for uh, to be following a bird on Twitter uh, as they're tweeting. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. It's been it's early for us kids. Sorry about that one. Do you think there's like really polarized? You know, these birds are really you know opinionated. (laughs) (laughs) Um. No, I think most of the time the birds, they just seem to care about food. That's all they want. Food and attention. Have you noticed that when um, doing research on birds that they have like a personality, like a, some uniqueness from bird to oh, bird? Oh, absolutely. You... Absolutely. What's that yeah. like? Um, so the birds I tended to work with were parrots. Um, so a range of small parrots to sort of medium sized parrots. Um, but all of them, you could definitely tell, had their own personalities, um, and it would show in the way they would, um, you know, approach uh, me when I was in the room, or how they would react to being handled. Mm-hmm. Uh, some would just go with the flow, you know, that have no problem with it. Some of them it'd take a few weeks to to get over being handled. They might be a bit more cautious, um, and then the way they flew flew as well. So some, um, we had a a wind tunnel set up at the university. <laughs> which was essentially a uh, a giant treadmill, but for flying animals, so they could fly on the spot uh, in a gust of uh, in a yeah a gust of wind, basically uh, that we could set the the, the speed of, um, and it was a great way of of training them up uh, to fly for a certain amount of time, um, and then we could measure certain variables about how they were flying. Um, but yeah, they would. You would see a lot of individual differences in how they would fly. Some would prefer yeah. to fly in certain areas of the wind tunnel. Uh, we, we we would think that some uh, might cotton on to the, the fact they could gain benefits from if they flew close to the back, um, they were able to get benefits from uh, like aerodynamic benefits so they could save energy. Some would prefer to fly close to the front. <laughs> um, 
and mm. just in, in the style of flight as well. So some would constantly be flapping, where some would flap really fast and then relax, and then they'd float back a bit, and then they'd do a lot more flaps. And so, yeah, it's it's interesting because there's no there would no be no clear uh, benefit in some cases. It's, it just tended to come down to that's just how they preferred to fly. If you were measuring energetics there, what what kind of things were you measuring? I'm just I obviously you mentioned that you know you're adjusting variables in the wind tunnel, but are you are you measuring other things about the birds themselves? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, energetics is the study of uh, the flow of energy uh, in the in the world, but specifically we're looking at how it's uh, yeah used by the bird to power flight. And one way we can indirectly measure energy use is through um, breathing so athletes when they're being tested and trained they'll use a respirometry setup which is essentially a mask they'll wear they might go on a treadmill um they'll do some exercise get their heart pumping get um their rate of breathing increasing Um, but also the ratio of gases that they're inhaling and exhaling will change as well depending on how much energy they're using and so we can do that with birds as well so we designed uh, that do they have little masks? <laughs> yeah, so we designed a, uh, a series of small oh, masks sort of designed to, <laughs> to fit around a bird beak. Uh, we'd tailor them to fit uh, individual birds, make them nice and comfy. Um, huh. And because we were working with parrots, uh, they're very intelligent birds. They're very quick to learn. So after a matter of minutes, um, you know, they'd be fine with flying with the mask. Um, they probably would. They probably couldn't understand why they were wearing it. Um <laughs> Um, but it was a very quick and easy, non-invasive way for us to measure their rate of breathing whilst flying. Uh, when they were done, we'd let them have a rest, pop the mask off, and uh, and that would be that. We'd have uh, gas samples that then we could uh, analyze, um, see if the ratio between oxygen um, being consumed and carbon dioxide being produced um, was affected by flying at different speeds. And so, yeah, that's one way we could, we could look at the costs of flight um, between different birds, between different speeds. Um, to sort to, to analyze uh, larger patterns in bird flight. So, if we're looking at migration, for example, what are energy efficient uh, flight speeds? Or if we're looking at birds hunting or foraging, uh, how much energy is it worth putting into different types of flight to guarantee they get meals? Um, so, yeah, there's a, there's a lot you can do uh, with birds in a wind tunnel to to find out how much energy they're using. Hmm. So. One of the questions we've usually asked our scientists on the show is, um, why why should we care about that? What what can we learn from bird energetics? Um, so, as I as I just mentioned, um, in a world where the climate's changing, uh, a lot of species are at risk, um, especially with with changing habitats as well. Birds that are migrating long distances and having to carefully partition their energy. Um, it's important for conservationists to be able to understand how these birds are using that energy. Um, if they're banking on finding a location where there's going to be lots of food for them to replenish, but suddenly that habitat's gone, how are they going to then have to change their style of flight to, to match that? Are they going to have to fly somewhere else or are they going to have to fly slower or speed up, maybe flying groups um, mm. to save energy that way? Um, but it also gives us uh, an understanding of how we can use similar strategies of flight as well for things like um, micro air vehicles for drones so formation flight um, is a very interesting uh, group uh, way of getting around um, and we well we believe it increases coordination between birds um, but also saves energy by flying in an aerodynamically beneficial posi- uh, formation and so if we can take those uh, understandings about how different flight formations save energy maybe we can apply those to our own vehicles as well. So if we're uh, conducting rescue missions using drones, how might we best uh, send in a formation of drones that could ensure they last, uh, they can stay in the air for longer. Do you ever watch like uh, superhero movies like what, like the Avengers and you're like, oh, you, you got the flight all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I try not to do it too much, um, <laughs> but I did... I did a um, a fantastic YouTube video, um, I think it was a few years ago, um, with um, Dr. Simon Clark, who does uh, amazing science YouTube videos. Uh-huh. His idea was to look at uh, fantasy creatures that fly and see how realistic they oh, really well, are. Sure. 
Um, oh, like, so we looked at things like, like uh, wyverns and dragons and stuff. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so some dragons are um, pictured as having four legs and wings, um, and we discussed how in nature that that is quite interesting for vertebrates because it takes a lot of muscles mm. to power wings. And so if you've got wings and four legs, <laughs> where are those muscles going to go? Um, but things like bats, obviously, they have wings um, that, that are their arms. They don't have four limbs plus their wings yeah. because they just there's no room to, uh, to put both lots of fly muscles and, and leg muscles as well. I never even thought of it that way. Like that's a whole, like, you know, when those creatures go to the gym, they got to work a whole extra set. (laughs) 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 It's a leg day, arm day and wings. Oh, geez. Um, So, yeah, I try not to get too distracted by, you know, things that are clearly there just for entertainment and enjoyment. But um, it is nice when you see it, you know, an anatomical, anatomical design that, does have some rationale behind it so uh i can't remember if it is wivens that have you know just two legs and then their yep, wings that's a wiven. yeah so that that to me at least uh is is more appealing it just it does make slightly more sense but it's not going to put me off watching watching things that you know yeah, have, i've seen um, some things Griffins about like the things. dragons in game of thrones which are technically wivens i guess because yeah. they don't have four legs and there's been so many, um, a couple people who have been on our show too that have like tried to try to do the math on how many lambs <laughs> they'd have to go out and eat just to go from here yeah. to here to there. <laughs> well, that would be that would be the energetic side of it, yeah. So that would yeah. be uh, that would be interesting research. So now you're not doing actual research in the field right now. You kind of shifted gears a little bit. You're you're working with science education. Can you tell us a little bit about what you do there? Yeah, so um, once I completed my PhD, I was looking for a little bit of uh, a change in my day-to-day routine. Um, I was really enjoying doing science outreach, science communication, uh, public engagement. Um, And so I was looking for jobs that allowed me to do that. Um, And interestingly enough, uh, I found a job working for a a football club or a soccer club. Um, And... uh, so I'm, I'm currently working for Leicester City Football Club, uh, which is huh. a mm-hmm. club in the Premier League, um, which is the top echelon of, of uh, national football in the UK, or in, um, in England, I should say. Isn't Liverpool like on some crazy streak right now? Yeah. So hmm. <laughs> we uh, Leicester City were second below Liverpool uh, hmm. for a while this season, um, but there's no okay. way anyone, I think, is catching Liverpool this year. Yeah, like they're I don't know. Liverpool. They're doing even, fantastic. Even our Patriots mm-hmm. lost in the... Before the, yeah. the season Don't ended, talk so about mm-hmm. them. they shall not be named. <laughs> <laughs> Dale's gonna edit that part out, so you all you know who you are. <laughs> um, but getting back to uh, yeah, what how I ended up at a football club, um, they do a lot of um, community work, so they have a charity side and they have a really good education team, um, that's taking. Um, staff out into schools to work with children who maybe don't engage with um, subjects in the in the classroom environment. And so by us coming in in our track suits with footballs and maybe appealing to those kids who enjoy sport more sure. um, than curriculum based topics. Uh, so for me, for example, I'm uh, I'm the STEM coordinator. So anything science, technology, engineering, maths. Um, I engage with schools. I come out and deliver workshops. Um, some of them are based around the curriculum to try and engage with those children who, again, are struggling, um, but also trying to bring more modern research in, into into the classroom. Uh, so we talk about um, uh, things like going to Mars. So that's a, that's a big thing this year. A lot of Mars missions are going up. And so any classes that are learning about space, they might be learning about the solar system. Why not get them excited about you know, things they'll be seeing in the news uh, that are happening right now. Um, so, yeah, it's all, it's all about trying to um, engage with them in a way that maybe raises aspirations to do with science. They might not see themselves as being able to be a scientist, mm-hmm. but just trying to produce role models and show that science can be interesting and fun. And if there's something they like, chances are there'll be some scientific research uh, linked to it. Um, so this this whole project, um, I should say, is being funded by the 
Primary Science Teaching Trust, fantastic organisation in the UK, um, all to do with uh, trying to engage uh, younger people in, in science. And where does that take place then? Is that taking place in schools or? It's a mixture. So uh, a lot of it is, is done in schools. We go out to schools, mm-hmm. but we also bring schools to our football stadium as well, which provides a, an amazing experience uh, for the children. And we can sneak in some science uh, that way as well. So mm-hmm. uh, we've for British Science Week, which is coming up next month, well, I should say in March, um, we've got a, a big event. We're inviting lots of schools and we're going to be doing a lot of science that celebrates um, Lester's role in scientific discoveries. For example, mm-hmm. um, DNA fingerprinting uh, that's used a lot in forensic science. Uh, that was first developed and first used in the UK by Sir Alec Jeffries. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. Um, here in Leicestershire. Mm-hmm. So it's just trying to yeah raise awareness of former guest of the show. Yeah, oh, really? had, we had him on yeah. back in uh, yeah. the wow. first oh, season. Incredible. Yeah, yeah. Oh, amazing. That yeah. was that was actually yeah. one of our most fabulous shows because he talked it's about our the podcast name and, drop right there. Yeah, it's a, <laughs> uh, but it, it was such a great show because he he did a wonderful job talking about the ethics of the potential abuses of DNA fingerprinting, some of which are absolutely coming to fruition now. But anyway, yeah, um, it's kind of neat to listen to it now. Like I think it's been ten years ago, twelve years ago, twelve, thirteen, and um, like he sounds a little like an oracle now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, it's interesting because. Um, we do this show for the National Science Teaching Association, and they changed their name and kind of focus over the last year or two from kind of, they, we used to be the National Science Teachers Association, and the name change has now been Science Teaching. And it was really to kind of address that there's all these other ways that um, science reaches our students, and um to give that in our name and in the things that we do that that was that shift and listening to your story, Alex, so far you've talked about like when you're, you, you've got started as a kid, you know, nature shows you talked about and going to museums and now you're doing like an outreach program here, connecting it to the sports. It's really definitely speaking to all those many ways, classroom and beyond classroom that can bring interest into science and maybe someday you wind up researching birds as a as a career yeah yeah exactly that's fascinating um, mm-hmm. no it's fun. i i really enjoy doing it and um i find it incredibly rewarding as well i re- i do really like the um that you mentioned that the name change there to uh you know t- science teaching Mm-hmm. Um, just cause yeah, in, in this, in this field, I get to meet a lot of teachers in schools, but, um, I also work very closely with the national space center here in Leicester, uh, which is the country's, uh, leading, um, uh, visitor attraction for anything to do with space. Uh-huh. And I work, uh, as part of the community team there. So doing a very similar role, um, taking science out to people who may not be engaging with the space center. Um, and even though I might be talking about space, we might be doing a lot of space related demonstrations. If you talk to some of the children and they say, well, space maybe isn't for me, but they're interested in another aspect of science. Just, yeah, just telling them my story, how, you know, I really enjoyed animals and, you know, I ended up getting to work closely with them and find out more about them. And just, just saying that, you know, it's, it's possible if there's something you really, really enjoy uh, and you like the scientific method, you like exploring and discovering, um, chances are if you, if you follow it, there'll be, there'll be something for you. Sure. Now, has there been a, ch- a time that you have been doing these things with students and you've um, had the opportunity to reach back to some of your bird research? Maybe oh. you're doing something on space and you're like, hey, you know what? <laughs> uh, <laughs> the parakeet uh, actually is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have there been connections there? I know you talked oh. about like, drones, maybe like maybe future space travel drone of, you know, drones, that kind of stuff. Has there been yeah. some connections? So uh, one of the uh, the one of the workshops I run with uh, with my school students is all about bird flight adaptations. <laughs> so that was very much influenced by you know what oh, I'm okay, passionate sure. about um, and trying to share that with them. Um, so it 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 takes the form of essentially paper plane making, um, uh-huh. but looking at how nature has adapted different bird forms to suit different functions. You have peregrine falcons that are masters of speed. Uh, you know, they're living weapons, they're missiles that go really high into the sky and then drop it. They can go up to speeds of about 250 miles an hour. 
Yeah. And they're, 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 they're old. Are they the ones that are working? They've been kind of... Is that in Mongolia where they trained with like these hunters, the falcons? Am, am I thinking of the right bird? I just saw a TV it might show be. about this where um, it's a... a it's a pretty secluded group. Um, they train these birds and they hunt with these birds. I mean, they essentially need these birds to survive. They're huge birds. It's like falcon falconry. Yeah, um, it might be. Um, peregrine falcons are one of the most successful predators, I'd say, on the, on the whole planet. They, you can, they're found on, I think, all continents apart from Antarctica. Uh, they're yeah. very widespread. They do well in the wild. They do well in city environments. They're big fans of chasing pigeons, so mm-hmm. if you live in a city, <laughs> chances are you might you might see a peregrine falcon if you're lucky. Huh. Um, so it's yeah, it's looking at the contrast between birds like that and then condors, um, who are also eat meat, but because uh-huh. they are um like vultures, they're not uh, hunters. Um they'll wait for things to die and then they'll scavenge. For them it's not about speed, it's more about efficiency, just trying to stay in the air for as long as they can. Don't use any energy. Just they want to be nice and observant, see what's going on, but mm-hmm. they don't have to get anywhere particularly fast. So it's looking at how the birds, yeah, use energy differently. One for speed and one for staying in the air. Do you get a chance to talk about like evolutionary history, like you know, like where we kind of see those first um, pieces of evidence of flight in birds? Um, so it's not something I tend to go into uh, with with my primary school students, um, mm-hmm. but I have I have done uh, a few talks, uh, school assemblies, and to the general public as well about um, yeah where we see the origins of of bird flight, starting back with with dinosaurs. Um, yeah, uh, yeah I'm I'm kind of looking for yeah like where that you know what what was the evidence about you said you did some talks yeah. um what was the evidence that it, are there some points that we can see the the switches flip and like that first flight took place i mean obviously it's we don't have the kitty hawk footage of the <laughs> 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 um but you know like what what where what do we have in um our ev- evidence of evolution that shows when that transition took place um or so we branching do- i guess we do have fossil evidence of some early birds. Mm-hmm. Um, for example, Archaeopteryx, uh, one of the birds that we've we've found some fantastic specimens of uh, that not only preserved bones, but also uh, imprints of feathers. So there's a really lovely specimen at the Berlin Natural History Museum mm-hmm. um, where you can, you can make out incredible feather detail on the wings. Um, and it's... It's hard not to look at that and think they they wouldn't have been used for flight in some way, even mm-hmm. if it was a more rudimentary getting from one branch to the other quickly or being able to climb a tree, getting from the ground up um, with a little bit of a boost. Um, so we, we definitely we definitely have compelling evidence um, of where where we see these origins of, of bird flight starting. Mm-hmm. And we, we've been seeing a lot more evidence coming out of China, too, especially. Yeah. There's yeah. been a lot of really good fossils coming really? out showing, uh, yeah, re- like a, a lot more detail about what the feathers might have looked like and um, even some evidence, even even suggesting colors and such, too. Yes. Um, I actually uh, I talked with a group uh, not too long ago, um, and they were taking um, yeah chemical samples from... Um, uh, well, this was from eggs, actually. It wasn't feathers. Um, but yeah, they were able to find out exactly the color of uh, dinosaur eggs that, you know, from millions and millions of years ago just by taking tiny chemical samples and yeah. being able to extrapolate that information to say this you know, this very likely, you know, they were this this color. So it, it's amazing the, the amount of information we can get from such a long time ago. My cats are always fascinated by the birds flying outside, and I always like to think <laughs> oh, I, bet. I would be fascinated by, by watching little <laughs> flying dinosaurs myself. And I, I like to remind my uh, students that I work with, too, that that's, you know, you really, dinosaurs are all around you. <laughs> they're, yeah. They're watching yeah. you all the time. <laughs> okay, well, Alex, you have um, obviously the ear of students and teachers within the United States and the rest of the world. Um, what would you like to leave us with? <laughs> for the rest of the world, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna have to have a think. Uh, think for a second about that one. Um, I'm leave them with. 
well, I, I kind of threw that on you. A lot of times we, we've <laughs> been ending this show with um, um, kind of like a researcher's like a suggestion to students. Like if you want to oh, get into kind of science, uh, yeah. what what are your suggestions there? What do you want to leave us with and go from there? I'd say um, growing up today, um, I think the wealth of information that is out there is staggering with uh, not a, you've got books, of course, mm-hmm. but the information available on the Internet in so many different forms. Uh, it, I think it creates incredible opportunities to be able to explore these ideas outside of school. So if you find out something in school, but you want to take it further, um, just to, even on things like YouTube, there'll be so many videos tailored to different audiences so there'll be ones for uh younger people children who might be interested in learning more about birds um and then from that then they might find groups as well um where they can talk about birds discuss uh recent news about birds um i'm just using birds as an example here sure from experience yeah but yeah no um the world at the moment is an amazing place to be able to find out not only what we know about birds but also what we don't know what are the next steps what are the mysteries uh and knowing those things are amazing because it could be that you end up being that person who who makes that discovery who uh, solves the mystery so yeah don't be afraid to uh to get out there and, and try and find out information and and if it doesn't exist you could be the one to uh to find it out huh, i love it that's awesome Excellent. <laughs> dr evans thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us for Not us this problem. morning for you what time is it by you Twelve thirty. uh Yes, in the afternoon. So, but uh, <laughs> so we we can have this uh, transatlantic connection here. So we really appreciate it. Not a problem. Very, I enjoyed it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. You too. Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Lab Out Loud. If you'd like to learn more about some of the things discussed in this episode or previous episodes, you can find show notes at our website, laboutloud.com. If you have a guest idea or a future topic that you'd like to see on Lab Out Loud, go to our contact page and send us a message. Also, you can subscribe to Lab Out Loud on your favorite podcasting app, such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you like to find podcasts. While you're there, leave us a review and rating. Your input helps others find our show. Thanks again for listening. 